Hello, Victory Family Church. Hallelujah. Greetings in the name of Jesus from the Life Center in Beirut. This is Pastor Saeed Deeb, and I would love to thank you, thank every member, every leader, every pastor in this church, especially Kingdom Builders. Thank you, Kingdom Builders, for helping us building the kingdom in this uh, part of the world in Lebanon. In spite, we have no electricity. We're queuing for uh, gas for our cars for sometimes 11 days to, t to get uh, 20 liters. There is no gas, no diesel, nothing, nothing, nothing. But because of you, because of your prayer, we, we are encouraged to continue and give life away. And last week, last Friday, we, we have 100 new, new students. They know nothing about the Bible. Those who help and support with food parcels, they decided to come and study the Bible. Can you imagine? And now their lives is being really changed and they're so happy. Now we have 250 to 300 new students. We want you to pray for them. At least they know nothing about Jesus. They don't come to church, but now they start coming on Wednesday morning, Friday morning to learn the Bible. And also we give them a food parcel once every month. We don't forget also the help for our uh, Syrian refugees. We still have uh, 100 families. We're supporting them fully with Bible classes as well as with food. Hallelujah. Uh, everything is collapsing in Lebanon. However, the church is thriving. We want you to keep helping mutual faith, um, especially in Lebanon. And uh, keep, keep us in your prayers. Keep our leaders because the, the, the work is big, awesome, but the workers are few. Pray for the Lord of Harvest to send us full-time missionaries to help us here. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you very much. Praise the Lord. You all may be seated. You're so very kind. What a privilege to be here today. And when I received the uh, communication from Pastor John, my heart got happy. Your beautiful Pastor Beloved. John the Beloved, I call him, and uh, uh, invited me to be with you this, this weekend. And what a great week as you approach next Sunday, bringing your Kingdom Builders offering to the Lord. And I'm just a little expression of your love in your life in other places. And this is the beautiful thing about Kingdom Builders. I know of no other ministry, no other church like yours that has such strength in uh, a calling. You know, it's not just like an assignment. It's a calling God's given you as a community. And so I really want to encourage you this week to uh, bring your best uh, next week as Pastor John is here then and invite you to bring your Kingdom Builders offering. What you all are doing around the world is really, really significant. And as you can see from the video from our team in Beirut, Lebanon, what uh, pain and headache and heartache in that whole region of the world. But Jesus still reigns and Jesus is Lord of all. And so this is why each of us in our world where we are, we need to make sure our mindset is not uh, too attached or too attracted or too trapped in this world system. You know, we're in the world. We're not of this world. We are citizens of heaven, the Bible teaches. We are in the kingdom of God's dear son. So this has to influence the way we think. You know, I've noticed uh, in our world today, even uh, in the United States with social media and everything else and news and just everything is so contentious. It's like in families and everywhere and it's, it's, it's very easy to be so contentious about everything, whether it's politics, whether it's about sporting teams, whether it's about COVID, whatever the situations are. And uh, I'm, I'm learning to uh, put myself on a diet from world system thinking and not take in the, uh, the, the world view of a world system, but to keep my mindset in the kingdom of God's dear son. And I wanna show you today why this is so important in the assignments God gives us in life. So you have this gigantic assignment, just was announced 1.6 million, that the church by the grace of God and through the faith of God's people is gonna gather and, and disperse the love of the Father all over, locally as well as internationally. It's, it's, it's an amazing thing, but everybody has to uh, do their part, so to speak, and everybody has to do it with a mindset that's heavenly, that's uh, really with the love of God in Christ. So I wanna share some things with you that I think are gonna really, really refresh your soul today. It's so simple, it's exciting. I love to preach the simplicity that is in Jesus Christ. And this is, to me, the thrill of the gospel. It's, uh, it's so beautiful. So follow along with me if you have a Bible or uh, the verses as well will be on the screen. By the way, all of you watching in uh, digital land, welcome. Uh, all the different campuses, welcome. 
I'm so excited that I can share it with you as well today. And I just know God's going to refresh your soul in a deep and mighty way. Go with me, if you would, please, in your Bible to Mark chapter 4. Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, verse 24. This is what Jesus said about all the news uh, that floats around. He says, uh, verse 24, Jesus said to them, Take heed what you hear. Now think about this. With all the social media, with all the platforms, with all the news outlets, with all the apps you can have on your phone, with all the information, a lot of it can be nonsense and trouble your spirit and put you in a, a, a wrong frame of thinking about yourself and about everyone around you. That's why our mindsets have to be in him and in the kingdom of God's dear son. So Jesus says, take heed what you hear. This is talking about content, what you hear. And that's why I've put myself on a fast. I restrict what has access here. Because when I get caught up in world system thinking, I'm irritated, I'm agitated, I'm grumpy, I'm frustrated. I can make people mad. I can say things I wish I never said. I know none of you are like that. That's why I like you all so much. But what I've had to do is put myself on restrictions from world system thinking. Jesus said you need to take heed what you hear. It's content. Make sure you have the heart of the Father in your thought life. It's very important. Let's go to another verse. This is what Jesus said as well. Luke chapter 8, verse 18. Jesus said, therefore, take heed how you hear. So Jesus gives two instructions. Take heed what you hear, content. Take heed how you hear, maybe your attitude. You know, it's very easy if your mind is filled with world system thinking, it's hard to hear the gospel. It's hard to be moved with compassion when your heart is filled with world system thinking. When you're trying to fix everything according to the world system thinking. It's, it, 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 like, it, like, it, it exempts you from really understanding the heart of the Father in the ways of God. So Jesus said two things, content and attitude, what you hear and how you hear. Now, with those thoughts in mind, I want to tell you a Bible story. It's so simple. I'm going to read the Bible story. It's found in the book of Acts. But as we're reading the Bible story, I'm going to pause throughout the story to give a little a broader context and worldview to the story. I think you'll see what I mean, and I think you'll see how it applies to you and to me in our lives today and why it's so important as we approach Kingdom Builders uh, a weekend, really, next, next weekend. So go with me in your Bible to a story in Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, the story begins in verse 7, and here's how the story goes. The Bible says, Now on the first day of the week, what's that? That's a Sunday. When the disciples came together to break bread, let's pause. So people were gathering, disciples, believers, kingdom people, people who are in the kingdom of Jesus, people who were born again, people who are followers of the Lamb of God. And it said they came together to break bread. What does that mean? Well, they probably had a meal. I like to gather with people and just eat. Eating is one of my spiritual gifts, hallelujah. I enjoy, you know, and by the way, I must say, coming here uh, to be with you all at uh, Victory, uh, boy, you all have fed me, like, amazingly. I, I, this is like, I, I, I need self-control when I come to your church. It's, it's amazing. Your pastors and leaders, they all feed me so wonderfully. But anyway, they came together to eat, to share a meal. But breaking bread just doesn't mean having a common meal. It means having the communion meal. Breaking bread in the book of Acts many times is the implication of taking communion. What is communion? When you have the cup of blessing, when you break the bread. It's the perfect picture of preaching the finished work of Jesus. And this is the way you preach to yourself many times as you take communion and you announce the truth of your own identity in him, in him and you. This is the way we identify. We identify in Christ. Our sins have been forgiven. Hallelujah. The blood has done a perfect work to perfect us eternally, the Bible says. And we're established now in a new system, a new covenant, Jesus said. And it's a new covenant based on better promises. It's promises that are in Christ, that he's the one that did all the work to get you what you need. He did it. It's a beautiful thing. So they came together, believers, to break bread, to have communion. Let's read on in the story. It says, Paul, 
Let's pause again. Here's the first character in the story. Who's Paul? Now, most of you know this is the Apostle Paul. Some of you may not know. Some of you may be new to, to Christianity or the faith. Let me explain just for everybody's understanding who this guy Paul is. Paul was an apostle here in the book of Acts. He did a lot of missionary journeys. He planted churches. He established people in the faith. But Paul was not always called Paul. He was a brother called Saul. And he was, a, he was a Jewish man. He, 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 in his own resume, said he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was a scholar. He was brilliant. He was taught by the best uh, intellects uh, in his day. And uh, he, he did not like those folks who were followers of Jesus as Messiah, followers of the way in the book of Acts it describes. And so he persecuted people who put their faith in Christ. He was religious, but he was full of rage. He was full of terror. And the Bible teaches he would consent to people's death. He would haul people to prison. He would bind them. And one day Jesus, in his love for Saul, had enough. And Jesus said, I think I'll have a conversation with this brother. Huh? And remember the story in Acts 9, there was a light from heaven brighter than the noonday sun, and a voice, Jesus speaks, Saul, Saul. Why? Why are you persecuting me? And the light was so bright, the word was so rich, it said Saul fell to the ground and he was blinded by the light. He couldn't understand it. He couldn't see it. So Jesus gave him instructions. He gave him an address. Jesus said, go to a street called Straight. You're going to find a brother at a house named Ananias. And this guy, Ananias, is going to instruct you, give you information that will become revelation that brings you preservation. And so he went there and Saul became a believer. He put his faith in the one he hated. He put his faith in the one he despised and his name was changed. Saul became Paul. And it says straightway Paul preached Christ to people. So he became a follower of Jesus Christ. This is who this character is. And this guy, Paul, then God used... A little later, he says in his testimony that God separated him from the saints, so to speak, and took him to the desert where he was unknown by face for three and a half years. He was unknown by face, and in the desert, Jesus talked with him, and Jesus revealed to him the revelation and the beauty and the strength of the new covenant. In other words, the redemptive life of Jesus. And then Saul began to write the letters. You have a Bible. I have a Bible. In your Bible, you have an Old Testament, which is the prophets and the law of Moses and the Psalms and beautiful, beautiful things pointing to Jesus. But then you have a New Testament. In the New Testament, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is Jesus according to his physical life, the flesh life. But then you have the book of Acts where our story is from. And then you have the book of Romans, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, First and Second Thessalonians, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews. All of these are written by this guy, Paul. Paul is the one Jesus used to reveal Jesus' life according to the cross, the redemptive life of Jesus. Paul has no stories of Jesus according to the flesh. Paul has stories of Jesus according to the cross. In this Pauline revelation in the New Testament, this is how you and I understand who we are in him. We identify in Christ. You and I don't identify according to the flesh. You identify in Christ. Faith puts you here. So Jesus' view of you is not according to you. Jesus' view of you is according to Jesus. Jesus is God's opinion of you. This is the astonishing beauty of the gospel. This is what every human heart needs to know. If you don't identify in him, you'll identify as anything. And this is the, our world system today. People identify as to whatever they feel. No, you identify according to what you believe, what Jesus has done. You identify in Christ, and you live a Christ life according to his nature, his character. So Paul's revelation was Christ is in you. Christ is in you. You are in him. Wow. 
This is the beauty of believing. So this is who our story is talking about. So let's read again back in verse 7. It says, they came together to break bread, have communion. Paul, this is Apostle Paul, he was ready to depart the next day on kingdom builders' assignments. He spoke to them, he preached to them, and he continued his preaching until midnight. Now think about this. The brother was long-winded. Paul was preaching, and he was preaching until midnight. Let's, let's say their meeting started at 6 o'clock for a common meal, communion, and then Paul starts preaching at 7. He's preached five hours. Wow. Let me ask you a question. If Paul is preaching, and he's preaching till midnight, what was Paul preaching? What was Paul preaching? Paul was preaching Pauline Revelation. He's preaching to the saints what Jesus has done for them and how you and I were included in him, that we died with him. We were buried with him. We were raised with him. We ascended with him. We're seated with him. This is Pauline Revelation. It's so powerful. It's so beautiful. It's like a mystery. The mystery of Christ in you. It's now revealed. It's for the believer. So Paul's preaching Pauline Revelation. So let's see what the story says next. Verse 8. There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. I want you to know something, friend. Anytime you take heed to what you hear and you take, take heed how you hear, the content is key. It must be the finished work of Jesus. It must be Pauline revelation. This is what the new covenant is established in. And anytime you're listening properly, the light goes on. There's illumination. There's revelation. I find when I talk to folks who are discouraged, always down, always fearful, always whatever, they're not hearing right. They have world system thinking and they haven't shifted their thoughts to the beauty of the Lamb. This is why I have to guard my heart immensely all the time now. Because I can buy into all this kind of tension and nonsense. I've got to guard my heart and I can get discouraged. I can get discouraged about ministry. I can get frustrated with life. I know none of you are like this. This is beautiful, but I struggle. So I have to really discipline my life to take heed to what I hear and take heed how I hear and make sure I'm listening to the revelation of Pauline preaching, which is the new covenant. And when I do, there's illumination. I have wisdom. I know what to do. I have solutions. They just show up. It's not like you work for it. It's present in the revelation of Jesus. And his spirit ministers to you. It's really powerful. So let's go to the next verse, verse 9. And in a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus. Let's pause again. Here's another character in the story. Who's Eutychus? He's a young man. The Bible doesn't really give you much information about him. But his name means something. Eutychus means good fortune. See, good fortune is what you and I really want. I want to show you how to find good fortune without seeing a fortune teller. You find your fortune in the love of the Lamb. You find your fortune in Jesus Christ, and it's good fortune. You have wealth in Christ. You have provision in Christ. You have wisdom in Christ. You have everything you're looking for in Christ. Eutychus, good fortune, or you could say favor, that's the grace of God. It's unmerited. You don't, you don't strive for it. You don't work for it. You don't qualify for it. You've been pre-approved for it. Good fortune, good favor was sitting in the window. He was young. Look at it, it says of him. His name was Eutychus. He was sinking into a deep sleep. Let's pause. Anytime you're sleeping at New Covenant teaching, you're in trouble. When you fall asleep to Pauline revelation, you're in trouble. And this is really the problem, I think, many times in the body of Christ, not just in America, but around the world. They fall asleep to Pauline revelation, and you end up living in your own flesh. You live, in according, you live according to your own capacity, to your own duty, your own efforts, your own trying. But the new covenant is different. You can't fall asleep to new covenant teaching or Pauline revelation. It has to be the, the primary 
importance to your life. You know, Jesus said, you got to choose what's important. You know, Mary, Martha was worried about many things. Mary chose the good part. She was beholding the Lamb of God. She was receiving the faith of God, the love of God, the grace of God. That's what's important, Jesus said. Take heed what you hear. Take heed how you hear, because if you're not listening to New Covenant teaching, you'll fall. Look at the Bible says. The story depicts it. He was sinking into a deep sleep. Don't fall asleep to Pauline revelation. It saves you. It tells you who you are. It delivers you from the headache and heartache that we've made of ourselves. He goes on to say, he was overcome by sleep, Eutychus, good fortune. And Paul continued preaching. What was he preaching? Paul in Revelation. And Eutychus fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. What a bummer. Huh? That's a meeting that went bad. You know what I mean? If I had a meeting and somebody dropped dead, I'd say, ah, yikes, you know. You know, if I was the Apostle Paul and somebody fell from the third story, boom. The dude's dead. My first thought would be, oh, no. Do I have insurance? Do I have liability insurance? Who's going to sue me? That's my mindset in the American culture. Who? Am I protected? But Paul didn't think that way. Look at, look at it says. So Eutychus fell from favor. He fell from your fortune. Because your fortune's in what you hear. Your identity is not in what you have. It's not in what you do. It's in who you belong to. You're in Christ. And in Christ, you gain everything you'll ever need beyond your wildest imaginations. The Bible teaches Pauline Revelation says above and beyond what you can even imagine. That's wealth. That's fortune. That's favor. It's in Christ. You have to train your mindset to not be trapped into the nonsense of a world system. Take heed what you hear. Take heed how you hear. So he fell. And he was dead. If, you, if you're not hearing right, if you're falling asleep to Pauline Revelation, you'll live like you're dead. You'll live like a carnal Christian. You'll live like you're spiritually dead. It's like the life of Jesus makes no difference in your midst because you're not hearing right. So verse 20, it says, Paul, he went down. It's a picture of Jesus. In his incarnation, Jesus came down. To show us the Father and to show us ourselves. We identify in him. And he shows us how good your Father is. Jesus, he said, is the perfect picture of Father. It's awesome. Jesus came down. Paul, Pauline Revelation, always goes to the lowest point. The messiest point. The dirtiest point. The deadliest point, because that's only a view according to the flesh. That's not a view according to divine life. Look at it, it says, Paul went down and he fell on him. And he embraced him and said, do not trouble yourselves. His life is in him. Now, friend, think with me for a moment. Let's pretend for the illustration that I'm the apostle Paul. I'm preaching Paul in Revelation, who you are in Christ, that you're righteous, you're blameless, you're holy, you're complete in his love. And people are astonished. And then the dude in the window drops. Boom. He's dead. I go down three flights of stairs. 30 feet. It's a long fall. Boom. Now, if Keith Hershey was there, I would kneel down next to him, maybe take his pulse, put my hand on his head and pray for him. That's not what Paul the Apostle did. Paul in Revelation fell on him. It's pretty vivid. He fell on him, and he embraced him. I call it the embrace of grace. Every person who's fallen, and we all have in some way, fallen out of fortune, fallen out of favor, fallen from walking with the Lord, fallen in our mindset, and had a carnal worldview of everything, and lived irritated and frustrated and agitated, we all understand what it's like being on the floor. We all understand. But the love of God comes and gives you an embrace of grace. See, the embrace of grace is the revelation of Jesus. The embrace of grace is not a person in the natural. 
It is a person, Jesus, but the embrace of grace is a living word that comes to you and tells you the truth of who you are and speaks to you. Your life is in you. It's amazing. See, people full of the grace of God and the favor of God listening to the revelation of the finished work of Jesus, they'll say something in the darkest hour. And they'll speak contrary to the natural, seemingly proof of death. They'll announce the life of God. And this is what is so powerful and so important. So Paul gave him an embrace of grace. And he lived. Look at the next verse. Verse 11. Now when he had come up, that's the Apostle Paul, and he had broken bread and eaten. Now think about this. He fell after midnight. Boom, he drops. Paul goes down, gives him the embrace of grace, speaks, your life is in you. The kids raised from the dead. Good fortune is restored. Good favor is restored. Notice that grace never rebuked. Paul never corrected him. What are you doing sitting in the window? You idiot. Don't you have a lick of sense? No, no, no. Paul's not like Keith or she. Paul wasn't con condescending. Paul wasn't judgmental. See, sometimes people need to be lifted before they're corrected. Does that mean we never correct people? Oh, no, the Bible gives many, many examples. You correct people, but you put them in a place where they understand first who they are. The Bible teaches when you awake to your righteousness that you are the righteousness of God in Christ. Now you have the capacity not to sin. So Paul didn't correct him. Paul just spoke life to him. You're the righteousness of God in Christ. God's life is in. He was raised from the dead. Paul goes back up three flights, sits down, and how did the, all the disciples celebrate? They didn't have another meeting. They didn't have another speaker. They did not have another seminar. They didn't have a prayer line so everybody could get Paul's anointing. You know how they celebrated? They had communion. They had communion. This is what you and I need to do constantly in thanksgiving. Jesus, you get all the praise. You saved my mindset today. You saved my relationship with my wife, my kids. You, 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 you helped me hold my peace. My mind is renewed to your love. I'm not agitated in this world system. I'm not frustrated with everything in our organization and ministry that seems to be wrong all over the world. It's a crazy mess. No, no, no. I have the revelation of the Lamb of God. You're preserved. And you speak life to people. This to me is so, so beautiful. And your celebration is in the revelation of the Lamb of God. Every praise is to our God. Every bit of worship in one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Like that old song that, uh, the song that now is powerful and popular and stirs your spirit. We, we have to get to a place we take heed what we hear, we take heed how we hear, and we celebrate the Lamb. Every praise is to our God. Are you all glad you're here this morning? This, to me, is thrilling. Paul preached five hours, but now look what happens. Now when they had come up, they broke bread together and eaten, verse 11, and they talked a long while, even till daybreak. And then Paul departed. Now think about this with me. They didn't have another meeting. They didn't have another seminar. They didn't get more information. Paul had already preached five hours. Then the dude drops. <laughs> Eutychus lost his fortune, lost his favor. Paul gave him an embrace of grace, restored him. And then they take communion and they talk. The ministry of yak. Yakety yak. Huh? You sit around and you just talk to one another. This is what our world needs. This is one thing we're doing, kingdom builders. You, you, you beautiful people who are part of kingdom builders, the things you've built, you know, in Lebanon, 
in, in the Philippines for us, the things you've done, the people you've fed, the, the refugees, all, all the things you've done, it, I, I marvel at it. You all like a gift of God that just came like a rushing mighty wind and, 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 and restored and, and gave us the equipping to, to meet the needs of beautiful people and give them an embrace and brokenness, deep brokenness. But the thing that I like about this is when you sit around and talk with people, you speak to them. No, your life's in you. No, you are the righteousness of God in Christ. God's view of you is what you need to think. You're not a dirty old rascal now. There's a way to take your place in Christ and walk in the revelation of Jesus and have victory in areas of your life. But you speak Pauline revelation to people. This is what you do. You tell people the truth of them in Christ and a light goes on because they're astonished. Nobody else in the world will tell them because most people only know them according to the flesh. You know them according to Christ. This is the powerful thing about preaching. I don't preach to people about their sin. They already know they're sinners. I preach to them about who they are in Christ, the finished work of Jesus. Not to be sin conscious, but to be Christ conscious and have victory over their sin. And this is an amazing strength and beauty that's even demonstrated in the story. Because you fail to hear the beauty of the finished work of Jesus in Pauline Revelation. You'll always take a fall. Look at verse 12 very quickly. It says, and they brought the young man, Eutychus, in alive. And they were not a little comforted. Isn't that a cool story? I like that story because it's really a picture of what Kingdom Builders does. You all, of course, you feed people. Beautiful. You provide accommodation for people. You've done that for us. You've built a, a life home, an orphanage for the girls in the Philippines. You've built a pavilion for us. You've done a lot of these things. You've fed a lot of refugees. You've done a lot of things. But the key for all of these things for me, for this gospel preacher, is to have an access to the heart of people to give them the embrace of grace. The truth of the love of the Lamb of God. That's what's needful. That's what's important. That's what brings lasting change. That's what changes a family. That's what changes a village. That's what changes a nation, a culture, a community. It's the revelation that people partake of and celebrate in what Jesus has done. I told you when Saul who became Paul, first preached, he preached Christ to people, the Bible says. But after he had his excursion in the desert, and Jesus talked to him about the life of Jesus according to the cross or the redemptive work of Jesus. That's what Pauline Revelation is all about. He preached different. Galatians 1, verse 16 says this. Paul said, to reveal his son in me that I might preach him. That's the whole difference in uh, New Covenant thinking. Now it's Christ in you. Christ in you, it's like, wow, you've got to be kidding me. See, you're wall-to-wall -wall Jesus, really, the Spirit of Christ, dwells in you. You have access now to everything you need. You have the faith of God in you. Jesus authors it. You have the love of God now in you. You have the grace of God in you now, the full favor of the Father. You have access to everything. This is Pauline revelation. You know, if you took any of Paul's books that are in our Bible, let's just say, for example, like the book of Ephesians, Pauline revelation, usually the first three chapters, like in these shorter books, tell you what Jesus has done for you, that he's reconciled you to the Father, that you have forgiveness of sins now, not according to you in your capacity to do so, but according to the riches of his grace. Amen. All you do is swallow it and say, you've got to be kidding me. Jesus did it all. And, and, and you understand who you are in him, the first three chapters. Then it says in chapter four, now therefore, you know, walk worthy and do this, that, and the other. It shows you how to live it, how Christ lives it through you. You can't do chapter four, five, and six on your own. You do it based on what you're hearing. You do it established in the revelation of who you are. It shows you how to have a marriage, how to love your wife. Love her to the degree that Jesus loved the church. Wow, you gotta be kidding me, really? Yeah. 
shows you how to uh, be angry and still not sin. Wow, I need to know that. That'd be kind of helpful. Shows you how to, you know, be kind. Wow, that, our world needs a little bit of kind. Tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as, even as, even as Christ forgave you. So your mindset still has to be anchored in the revelation of Paul, the redemptive love and life of Jesus, in order to live the life. Shows you how to put on the armor of God. Shows you how to not walk in the flesh, living like you're spiritually dead, like you took a drop from your favor and fortune and living like a carnal man. No, you don't walk in the flesh and all the works of the flesh. You walk in the spirit. Shows you how to live the life. So do we live the life? Of course. But you do it based and anchored in the teaching of the finished work of Jesus. Let me show you one other verse or two other verses real quick. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 16. This is Paul in Revelation to the believers in Corinth. Paul says, therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Let's pause. Now, this is quite an assignment. Paul in Revelation says you don't know anybody according to their natural life, their flesh life, or their death life. He goes on to say, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh or according to the Gospels, yet from now on we know him thus no longer. You know, there's a lot of people that know the Bible stories of Jesus and are never transformed because they keep it in the sense realm of trying to understand and figure it out. It's the revelation of his death and resurrection that qualifies you. This is what takes, brings the light on. This is the revelation of the love of God in Christ. That you're reconciled eternally before the Father. He said, we don't even know Jesus now according to the flesh. You know him according to the cross. You know, according to his resurrection. And then the next verse, you know by how, verse 17. Therefore, what's therefore, therefore? The previous verse. Because you don't know Jesus according to the flesh. You know him according to the cross. Therefore, if you are in Christ Jesus, man or woman, he or she is a new creation. Pauline revelation is a, that of a new creation. The old's gone, passed away, done, finished. Adios, goodbye. You are brand new in Christ Jesus. And all you did was believe it. And when you believe it, you receive it. This is the astonishment of preaching the gospel to Muslim people to me. Anywhere in the world, to let people know the revelation of their father's love. So kingdom builders, all the things that you are doing are so powerful and so important, but for me, it's setting the table. It's setting the table for the love of the Lamb of God. It's a powerful thing. It's a beautiful thing. One other verse, real quick, 2 Peter chapter 3. Peter, the apostle, says this of Paul. He says, as also in all his, talking of Paul, Paul's epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which some things are hard to understand. You know why people fall asleep to Pauline revelation? Because it's mystery. It takes the mind of the Spirit to unveil it to you. So if you're listening to people teach on all the nuance and strength and grace, for example, in the book of Hebrews, a Pauline book, or any of his writings, it's what? I died with Christ? I was crucified with Christ. Me? I was crucified then? Way back when? How, how do you, I, I was buried with him? Me? I was raised, that's Pauline Revelation. I, 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 I ascended, I'm seated with him. Yeah, you're seated with him when your mindset is thrilled with the beauty of what he's done. The truth of you is in him and with him. It's amazing, but it's, it's Peter says, and he's the apostle Peter. The apostle Peter said, this dude's hard to understand. It's hard to understand. And then he says, there are some people unstable people, they will twist to their own destruction like they do all the scriptures. So it's very, very important that you take heed what you hear and take heed how you hear. Did you like the word today? Give the Lord a shout. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Aren't you glad you're in the first service so I can't preach till midnight? Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, you're loved, you're blessed abundantly, and this is the good news of the gospel. 
And uh, I just hope you're refreshed. And I hope this week you really prepare yourself because what Pastor John Nuzo is inviting you to do is, is really a heavenly assignment. It's significant, it's important. And this is where you can't make a decision according to an earthly mindset. You make a decision based on the truth that you're in him and he's in you. And what is that of value to you for others? Yeah, all these people in the video that you saw, you'll probably not see the folk or different things. In fact, I do have some pictures. Maybe we can show some of the pictures real quick. Let's see some of the things you've been doing here. Do we have some of those photos available? I just want to show some of them. This is the building you just built. This is the life home in the Philippines. Isn't that wonderful for the girls? Let's go. This is some of the beautiful kids. These are all the lo lovely ones. Uh, they're all, they all behave perfectly. It's amazing. <laughs> okay, let's go on in the little pictures. This is a new thing called the Retreat at Victory Lane. We named our access to the road on the property Victory Lane after you, the kingdom builders. And I'm going to uh, train uh, young leaders and encourage people. I want to raise up Eutychuses in Muslim villages. Let's go to, this is what you're going to do. We're starting that actually in just a couple of weeks or a couple of months in the, in the new year. Let's go to the next picture. This is a, kind of the whole diagram architecturally in the gardens and everything. Let's go to another little picture. That You built that. That's called the pavilion. You all did all that. Yeah. Let's it'll go to another picture, and that's me. Pre Let's go to another picture. This is some of the things in the Middle East. You've seen some of these in the video. Let's go again to another picture, all this stuff. All these are new. We have 300 new Muslim people now want to be in Bible school. Can you imagine? Let's raise up a lot of Saul's. Amen? We call. Anyway, this is all the Syrians that you're feeding, and we feed the Syrians so we have access to the revelation of Jesus. It's the most important thing. It's the beautiful thing. So thanks so much, but be prayerful about this week and make a decision that's uh, from the heart of the Father for you. And uh, everything I've done in life, I've done scared. Never had anything to do anything, but I've had an assignment. And God has always fulfilled it. Always. I've been in full-time missions ministry 42 years it's amazing i'm only 49 no not really I, but you think the love of god it's amazing and the love of god is what you need right now maybe you've never given your life to jesus give your life to jesus today those of you watching online those in the other campuses go ahead those in this auditorium if you want to yield your life to jesus right now and be born again believe that he died on the cross for you, that he was raised from the dead for you, that he'll lift you from a dead life to a high life, an eternal life, a life of victory. If you'd like prayer to be born again, just raise your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. Would you do that all over? Or rededicate your life to the Lord? Anybody at all? Praise the Lord online. Praise the Lord. Put your hands on your heart. Let me pray. Say this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, I receive your love. You died for me. I believe it. You were raised from the dead. I believe it. I'm a new creation. Thank you for good fortune. Thank you for good favor. I have it all. I'm in Christ. I'm born again. In Jesus' name, amen. Give the Lord a shout of praise. Can you do that? Hallelujah!